Very good afternoon to you from Colombo, and this is the final event of today's proceeding trauma symposium. We have five speakers from all over the world, and uh, let me first introduce the first speaker, and uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Kenneth Bofford from uh, South Africa. He's uh, presently at uh, Mill Park Hospital uh, in the Department of Surgery. Formerly, he was the um, the professor of Surgery at the University of Witzwurz and uh, Johannesburg. Now he is the ISS uh, International Surgical Society Secretary General. And he has been with us uh, several times to do our trauma training. And uh, let, me, uh, let us now listen to uh, Professor Kenneth Buffard. He's going to speak on control of bleeding in difficult anatomical situations. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to be back at the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka, who in the past have been kind enough to give me an honorary fellowship. And my association with Sri Lanka has been warm, continuous, and I really appreciate the opportunity. The brief is control of bleeding in difficult anatomical situations. And I'd like to congratulate the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka on this particular program in this your golden jubilee year of 2021. We all know about ATLS, the National Trauma Management Course, which is run from the College of Surgeons, and the ABCDEs are all very well to start with. But we've evolved quite a lot since then. In the old days, the most of the DE deaths were due to airway problems. Nowadays, that has actually changed, and most deaths are due to bleeding problems. The more blood you're given, and the more you delay this process, the greater the number of deaths from post-surgical complications. So let's talk hemorrhage control. Controlling the bleeding and clotting and maintaining the blood volume are the primary concerns in trauma management. In a sentence, the treatment of bleeding is to stop the bleeding. If you do have to give a blood transfusion, it's an expression of failure. It means you haven't been able to stop the bleeding in time. The patient has lost a lot of blood and you've now got to catch up. The blood transfusion is not without complications. And it's like a marriage. It should not be entered into upon lightly, unadvisedly, or wantonly. And if you will, should never be entered into more often than is absolutely necessary. The physiology is very simple. The normal oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve most people are familiar with. Certain factors shifted to the left, particularly alkalosis, usually due to hypoventilation, and hypothermia. Even in Sri Lanka, your patients may arrive with a temperature of 32 to 34. That means your oxygen delivery to the tissues is significantly reduced, and this actually can be shown as a lactic acidosis. So the goal is very simple. You have to restore oxygen delivery to the cells by getting it into the lungs into the alveoli, onto the cells, and the circulation will then carry it to the tissues. We all know about the diagnostic approaches in trauma. Clinical examination is still extremely useful. E-fast, plain x-rays a little less so except for the chest. And the problem with the more sophisticated examinations is they take place either somewhere else or they take time to arrange. Angiography is only for patients who are stable. Stability is that the blood pressure remains constant. Death, the blood pressure remains constant as well. And uh, both in the CT and the angiography suite, this is where the patients die. If the patient is unstable and bleeding, then that patient needs an operation, not an examination. The second thing that I've learned is that primary brain injury does not cause shock. So that if you've got a shocked patient with a brain injury, that patient is not bleeding from the brain, but the shock may make the brain injury worse. The treatment of bleeding is to stop the bleeding. 
Well, who knows the anatomy best? Is it the trauma surgeon, the general surgeon, the vascular surgeon? The reality is the commonest cause of bleeding is actually for factor 14 deficiency. Hold on, I hear you say. There's only 13 clotting factors. You're absolutely right. Factor 14, it doesn't matter what surgeon, but the surgeon's finger is factor 14 and it stopped more bleeding than most other clotting factors put together. So what about the individual difficult to get at areas? Well, control in the neck is possible with digital or proximal control, and you can actually occlude the common carotid on one side. It won't stop the bleeding because the collaterals are so good, but it will certainly decrease the bleeding and buy you time. If you can, you can put your finger directly on the bleeding and a Foley catheter or catheters may be useful, although this patient took three catheters. And the reason was that although her stab wound was just below the ear, the knife had transected the external carotid artery at the bifurcation. Nonetheless, she was stable enough to have got to theater, be explored as a planned procedure. Patients bleeding from the cardiac box defined as between the nipple lines uh, on both sides and zyphosternum below and sternum above, generally penetrating injury. So if it is anterior, use a stenotomy. If it's lateral, use the thoracotomy. Pitfalls, don't rotate the heart. If you do that, it may fibrillate. If it's a penetrating wound, it's quite possible that it's come out at the back of the heart, so you are going to have to inspect it and exclude damage to the phrenic nerve when you are working in that area. And finally, all these patients need transesophageal uh, ultrasound to look at the back of the heart. Done the following morning. What about if it's torso bleeding? If there's bleeding in both cavities, except an extremist, open the abdomen first, because that's the place where the bleeding is difficult to localize. If it is direction, it's probably arterial in nature, and you should be looking at proximal control, either of the aorta in the chest or the aorta subdiaphragmatically. But you do have to divide the crura of the uh, diaphragm in order to get to it. In an obese patient, this is a challenge. The alternative is where you have vessels bleeding, be it mesentery or be it spleen, mass clamp the vessels and then do what you have to do. If you find when you get in, the bleeding, bleeding is dark and widespread, it's probably venous in origin, usually from the liver. It's low pressure and it can generally be compressed or packed. If there is bleeding just in the chest, put a chest tube fifth interspace anterior axillary line. 85% of bleeding will stop spontaneously. If blood loss continues, either volume per hour or a gross loss of more than a liter, then this patient is going to need an anterolateral thoracotomy and a segmental resection, generally with a gastrointestinal stapler. We do not use lung twists for hemostasis anymore because it tears the lung and pneumonectomy carries a huge risk. So you're better off controlling the hilum with a Satinsky clamp and then doing a regional resection. If you are going for bleeding of the abdomen, be aware what damage control surgery is and how to do it. Make a hole big enough to give yourself room. Incisions heal from the side, not from the top and bottom. Scoop out as much blood as possible, use swabs, fill up the abdomen with swabs, and then lift out swabs from the least likely area first. And if you can identify which quadrant, it will actually let you know probably what organ is there. If it's arterial or mesenteric, proximal control. If it's solid, compress it. What about the pelvis? Most venous bleeding, 85% of pelvic bleeding is venous. You can place a binder, put traction on the legs if necessary, and that will stop most bleeding. If it is a serious venous injury, your first course is replacement of blood. Elevate the foot of the blood so there's less venous pooling and extra peritoneal pelvic packing. If it's arterial, either Reboa 
or interventional radiology. I'll come back to Rabo in a moment. If there's groin bleeding, the Foley catheter does not work at the groin. So you either need direct pressure with your finger or with a fist, or you have no choice but to go for proximal control. And again, the Raboa has a place. Raboa stands for resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. And this is a relatively new technique. It's not cheap. Seven French gauge cannula inserted percutaneously into the groin, up into the aorta and blown up. It can be inserted into the thoracic or zone one aorta, which cuts off all aortic blood supply to the abdomen. Maximum duration, probably half an hour. It can be placed at the renals, but not usually done so, or it's placed in the lower aorta just above the bifurcation, which cuts off the blood supply to the pelvis and to the legs. It's relatively straightforward to put in, but it can't be left very long. There are modifications now where it's intermittently inflated or partially inflated. The problem is we're not quite sure when it's best. And frankly, when anybody gives you a new hammer, everything looks like a nail. So the Reboa is still looking for its role, true role in trauma surgery. You know about the adjuncts. There's source control from angioembolization. We can stent, we can control liver injuries and so on. And those are fine provided the patient is relatively stable. And then finally, be aware that the systemic adjuncts are as important after direct bleeding. Coagulopathy is the commonest thing. You need to understand as a surgeon what the coagulopathy consists of and comprises of. The gold standard for, for, for coagulopathy is now Rotem or TEG. And Karim Broey will be talking to you about all of this at a slightly later time. In essence, a small amount of blood is put into a cup tissue factors introduced and the cup is agitated or rotated and the clot forms. You have a period or of reaction time, which is clotting factors. You have a kinesis time, which is fibrinogen is converted to fibrin and the platelets activated and the clot is initiate, initiated, usually takes less than two minutes. The alpha angle is the angle of that uh, rise which is a reflection of the speed with which the clot is forming and requires good platelets. And the maximum amplitude says how many platelets you actually need. If that's reduced, you need more platelets. And then the clot contracts. If it contracts too much, that's called the lysis 30 time and is treated with tronexamic acid. So we can now go direct our resuscitation. And if you thought that was all complicated, think of glasses. A red wine glass is normal clotting factor profile. If it's a white wine glass with a light, long stem, then you're needing clotting factors. Some patients become hypercoagulable, particularly with COVID, and they have a brandy shaped curve. And platelet absence with a minimum MA amplitude give platelets. Champagne flute glass is again a low alpha angle and finally, when the whole lot collapses, that's tranexamic martini glass. So it's really quite difficult not to, if you've ever seen different glasses, know what you're dealing with. The summary is go for the compelling bleeding first. The compelling bleeding is what can I stop quickest? It may not be the most bleeding, but if I stop it quickly, then prioritize your cavity. Then prioritize arterial bleeding, which bleeds faster than veins. Control the venous bleeding. And then make sure that your patient is as fit as possible by limiting the coagulopathy. This is part of a session on all of this. And I'm very privileged to have taken part. I thank you for your time. I thank the college and congratulate it again on its anniversary and wish everyone well. Thank you, Professor Bhad. Uh, our next presenter will be Professor Elmin Stein, consultant trauma surgeon, uh, head of the Division of Surgery at the Faculty of Health Sciences of the Stellenbosch University and head of surgery at Tigerberg Hospital in Cape Town. <laughs>
uh, South Africa. And she is the current president of the EHSIC. And uh, she was instrumental in training the trainers when Sri Lanka started our own NTMC course. Over to you, madam. Greetings, uh, surgeons of Sri Lanka. Thank you for inviting me to speak. And uh, my topic is the management of complex pancreatic or duodenal injuries and um, trying to review what's new. Not always um, possible to find a lot of new evidence, but um, there's also a lot of valuable old management <laughs> evidence. So the pancreatic or duodenal injuries are, are not very common, but the mortality and the morbidity remains high. Morbidity, 50% mortality, always around the 20s. And we know why the injuries are very devastating. Um, so therefore this condition re requires a lot of complicated decision-making, especially regarding repair options and the timing of repair. Now I'm going to discuss the grade four and five uh, pancreatic injuries and the grade three to five duodenal injuries for lack of time. And just briefly referring you to this uh, World Society of Emergency Surgery algorithm for pancreatic injuries, which does incorporate the high grade and low grade and all the options of operative and non-operative and minimally invasive very nicely. So if you see this list of surgical management options for these injuries, then you realize that most likely there are not many of them that are perfect. And that means that there's many, many options, many, many difficulties related to the decisions of how to deal with these injuries. A lot of pipes and plumbing involved as well. Now, these are two recent articles um, on reviewing the trends in duodenal injury management. And both of them showed that there's a trend towards less invasive procedures for duodenal injuries, meaning that primary repair is being done more and more, especially in the last 10 years, for even for complex injuries. But that doesn't take away the fact that we still have the very high risk injuries, which may require complicated surgery and decision-making. In particular, um, these are the high-risk um, parameters that I'm showing here. And in the photo, there's a recent case where we had a gunshot wound through the head of the pancreas, right through the middle, but also causing a extensive, um, almost transection of the duodenum, which makes it quite a, a difficult injury to manage. The management principles are quite normal ones. We want to always make the early decisions about damage control, maybe non-operative management. Hopefully um, the, the principles of damage control are, are applicable, but I must tell you that it's not that simple when it comes to the duodenum, because if you want to clip and drop the duodenum, are you actually worsening the um, options for later management? And I would argue that if possible, don't clip the duodenum, rather repair it and, um, and shorten the surgical time for the other injuries. Non-operative management, hopefully we have pre-op imaging, but if that's not possible, you may have to decide intraoperatively whether there is a ductal injury and whether imaging is needed. An option that is very, very much uh, useful and used in, in these complicated injuries is staged definitive surgery. So if you discover that there's a very serious injury of the head of the pancreas, but it's not quite clear exactly if there's a ductal injury, then draining and closing with uh, followed by an MRCP or an ERCP if possible, would then ensure that we know exactly what the injury is and also enables us then to get the best um, pancreatic surgeon in to do the job if a, if a pancreatic duodenectomy is required. So that can be done very soon after the first operation. Don't wait too long as that would make things more difficult and more risky. In some cases, immediate definitive surgery is possible. If the patient's stable, if you have uh, the technical expert in the house and, and um, 
the, the conditions are favorable. The uh, definitive surgery depends on restoration of intestinal continuity and ductal continuity, ensuring wide drainage of anastomoses and, and repairs. Decompression of the lumen of the duodenum is important and also, most importantly, providing a plan for, and an option for nutrition, such as a jejunostomy or some kind of feeding tube, um, maybe naso, jejunal, or, um, or gastro, um, gastric axis. Looking at the moderate to severe pancreatic or duodenal injuries, the, the review from um, World Society of Emergency Surgery, published in the World Journal of Emergency Surgery, combines the, the AAST and the World Society guidelines and grading. And um, conclusions from this would be that immediate operative in intervention is better for the very significant serious injuries, that endoscopic and percutaneous procedures are useful for complications. And of course, we know the poor outcomes are associated with um, shock and delay and serious other injuries. This is the combined classification where the AAST grading and the World Society gradings are combined and um, may be useful for you to see. This is a very nice management algorithm where the gradings are combined also with the um, different potential injuries. So biliary tree, duodenal injury and pancreatic injury and combinations thereof is, is uh, set out in terms of operative and non-operative management. And also noting that some injuries may be considered for non-operative management or, or other interventions, but may well in the end require operative uh, management. So um, a, a nice algorithm and has to be brought into the context of the facility. So we don't all have all of these options available. For example, MRCP may not be available on short notice or ERCP certainly not in the operating room in my hospital at night, um, but then there are other options. Now I'm gonna focus on duodenal repair, especially the difficult repairs where primary closure is possible but you may have a high risk for leakage because of other factors, maybe patient factors, comorbidities, or other injuries. Pyloric exclusion traditionally was added in these cases, but one needs to remember that there is an additional risk to adding a gastroenterostomy and a pyloric closure. So, so this should not be considered a solution especially since even if the pylorus is closed, there's still going to be about six liters of bile and pancreatic juice running through the injured duodenum. Um, so carefully consider the potential value of pylor pyloric exclusion. The, the triple ostomy um, technique reflects the need for decompression and feeding and it adds also another ostomy or uh, another drainage of the stomach, which is not shown here. It, it, it does um, something to consider, especially the feeding tube, but also um, brings additional risks. This is uh, when duodenal repair is possible, but then the, the lumen is compromised. And I would say, rather than bringing this patient to a point where uh, a major resection or, or a a rewire loop is needed, consider the possibility of using a pedicle jejunal or gastric mucosal flap or a jejunal serosal patch, which could be a much simpler way of dealing with a potentially narrowed lumen. Um, right, so this is the more difficult um, conditions where there's near or complete transection and primary closure is not possible. For these, um, looking at the site of the injury, injury at D1 may require an antrectomy with a Bullroth II construction and then a closure of the duodenal stump, which would be then a, quite a long stump. Um, when there's an injury at D2, if the ampulla is intact, a Rue Y duodenal gen 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 directly onto the defect could be useful. 
or alternatively, the Rho Y is anastomosed to the, the, the stump of D1, leaving a quite a long um, diverticulized duodenal stump. And then an injury at D3 or 4 that cannot be con uh, reconstructed. If it's distal to the ampulla, um, connect to a Rho Y jejunostomy and close the, the distal um, duodenal stump. Assessing the injuries uh, and the ductal injury at the head of the pancreas is very important. And for this, we may need intraoperative contrast study, maybe uh, uh, via the cystic duct or the gallbladder, but don't open the duodenum to get the ampulla if it's not already open. Uh, Intraops ERCP, I don't know the logistics of that is quite challenging, but um, very definitely consider stage surgery. Drain, close, temporarily do an MRCP or ERCP and then come back as soon as possible to complete the, um, the, the surgery. We know that um, proximal injuries can be, may require a pancreatic cardiodonectomy, but in certain cases, a stent or a drainage alone, if there's no major ductal injury, may be appropriate. And then in distal pancreatic injuries, of course, a transection of the distal duct, best treated with a distal pancreatectomy um, to avoid all the fluid collections and risks of sepsis later. Pancreatic odiodenectomy remains appropriate in the severe injuries where there's tissue destruction and devascularization, and it has often been shown to be related to the surgeon's experience and, and skill. Although this study showed that the propense with a, with a com compared to other injuries that do not require pancreatic odiodenectomy, but similar in acuity, the outcomes is pretty much the same. So the Whipple is still appropriate. So in conclusion, we know these injuries remain challenging and radical surgery can be done with acceptable outcomes. Thank you, uh, Professor Elmin, um, uh, for updating us on the uh, major pancreatic duodenal injuries. And uh, let me introduce the third speaker, and um, Professor Karim Bori uh, from London. And uh, he's a, he's a consultant trauma surgeon and a vascular surgeon, and he's attached to a trauma center in the Royal London, and Professor of Trauma Sciences, and the director uh, of the Center for Trauma Sciences and Queen Mary Hospital, um, University of London. And his pet subject is uh, transfusion and uh, coagulopathy. And um, he will be speaking to us on the same uh, subject. And um, let's listen to uh, Professor Karim Bohi. I'm going to speak um, at this Congress. It's a real pleasure to um, be here. Um, obviously, a shame not to be there in person. So, a short um, update on trauma induced coagulopathy and transfusion. Uh, where I think I'm doing, just going to set the scene as to where we are now in terms of our understanding of what's going on and our treatment uh, strategy, if you like, for uh, how we should um, manage the acutely bleeding uh, trauma patient. So, we've done really well in the past um, decade or so in addressing death from critical bleeding in trauma patients. Um, at my hospital, over a decade, we nearly halved the mortality um, from critical bleeding, and that's continued to fall uh, over the uh, ensuing years. Um, and this really is through a directed approach to both understanding the disease process and then targeting our understanding with iterative changes um, in management. And that um, encapsulates itself essentially in moving um, management of active bleeding up before airway, before breathing, uh, and really is focusing on the bleeding component of the disease because of its recognition that it is the key um, cause of uh, early preventable death. And the strategy approached then is hemostatic resuscitation or damage control resuscitation where we prioritise coagulation over perfusion while the patient is actively bleeding. 
So we have to understand that the patient is actively bleeding at the time we're seeing them through their response to um, volume uh, transfusion. Uh, and then if they are actively bleeding, we have to make this decision where we may sacrifice some element of perfusion to prioritize hemorrhage control and um, coagulation. And so understanding that your patient is bleeding moves you to a very focused mindset of you've got to keep them alive, you've got to keep the heart alive, keep the heart perfused, um, you've got to stop them bleeding and maintain the body's ability to clot so that it helps you stop them bleeding um, either surgically, interventional radiology, um, whatever modality is the most uh, appropriate. And the hemostatic resuscitation principles that are associated with that then are early hemorrhage control, which takes priority, um, permissive hypotension while you do that, um, limiting fluid infusions to avoid dilution or coagulopathy, and then identifying and treating the underlying coagulopathy that may be present or may develop um, during the course of the resuscitation. So those are the tenets essentially which are based on our understanding that we cannot correct things while patients are bleeding. And so there's a continuous movement to um, hemorrhage control and maintaining our ability to control hemorrhage. And um, that hopefully gets written into your hospital's major hemorrhage protocol. Here's our major hemorrhage um, protocol um, here, which contains uh, when you activate the protocol, what you do initially and empirically, and as pa what how you monitor patients and as they continue to bleed, how you treat them and then how you step down um, the protocol. Uh, and I was lucky enough to visit um, the University Hospital in Colombo and this was stuck up in the resuscitation room in, uh, in Colombo and this is very, very similar to our own major hemorrhage protocol. And wherever you are in the world, whatever you have available to you, I think this is the key and it's not just a, a dry document, it's a living and breathing document that is developed over time, it's enacted, you audit your use of it, it is not just about transfusion of blood products, but it's also about how the hospital responds, how the operating theatre responds, who responds to these patients, and how it all comes together uh, into uh, improving outcomes. And there's a lot going on in most uh, updated major hemorrhage protocols. This is how we've uh, added things in over the course of um, the last decade or so. This is the associated mortality within the first 24 hours, black bars are within three hours. And you can see that it's not one thing that has saved lives, but multiple things coming in. You see here we introduce blood in the pre-hospital environment, and while that includes survival in the pre-hospital environment, it meant that sicker patients were coming into us, and some of those um, were dying, obviously, and we had to learn how to deal with the sicker group um, of patients. And if you look overall at the decade, so, uh, or this is like less than a decade, um, you can see that the, um, the white bars are uh, early, 2009, orange bars are later. And so we've been, made big impacts in pre-hospital uh, outcomes, but we've pushed some deaths into the, into the hospital. Uh, and if we focus on this in hospital, um, area. You can see more patients are dying very quickly of exsanguination, and exsanguination is still a big problem. Um, we've made big inroads into the 3 to 24 hour deaths, um, where um, much less deaths due to bleeding, especially very few patients bleeding out on the operating table. Um, but deaths due to brain injury um, coming into play, and we're still getting deaths due to um, multiple outcome, sorry, multiple organ dysfunction uh, syndrome, which is actually a big proportion of patients and bigger than we realise, um, mainly because this is a, now a different sort of multiple organ dysfunction syndrome that is driven by um, cardiovascular um, pathology, which I'll mention a bit later. So if we think about what we need to improve survival for trauma patients, this is the triad I think that we need to uh, manage. We need to stop them bleeding, maintain their clotting, and reduce the uh, time and therefore the effects uh, of ischemia that the cells suffer. So if we take bleeding, um, obviously we've moved very much to temporizing 
bleeding, uh, bringing damage control surgery, which may be the definitive uh, intervention as well, but also temporary use of devices such as um, tourniquets or even Reboa to push hemorrhage control, at least temporary hemorrhage control, further forward in the time course of the patient. Of course, these temporary devices create zones of ischemia themselves, and so that plays into uh, other outcomes. But as I said, it will improve early um, survival, which we then need to translate into later um, survival. But these techniques should be um, brought in as much as possible for bleeding patients, but some of them, like Reboa, are obviously very complex uh, and have steep learning curves, not just with the introduction of the device, but also with um, uh, management of complications, but I think Tal Hora is going to speak to you next on that. So prioritizing hemorrhage control as always, um, which still for most patients is in the operating room. And then maintaining coagulation and body's ability to clot. And our basic understanding of coagulopathy um, remains unchanged, that there is a acute traumatic coagulopathy which develops due to the injury itself. Um, which is then uh, combined with or possibly superseded by a resuscitation-induced coagulopathy due to the products that we give to volume resuscitate um, these patients. Uh, and so we have to avoid resuscitation-induced coagulopathy as much as possible, and we have to treat for the acute traumatic coagulopathy uh, as and when it occurs. And so we avoid crystalloid um, or clear fluids as much as possible, um, and instead prevent this dilution of coagulopathy by giving a combination of whole blood or something that looks like whole blood transfusion, usually red cells or plasma, uh, and trianexamic acid to prevent uh, and treat any underlying fibrinolysis, which is common in these patients. And then to identify acute traumatic coagulopathy um, is uh, using laboratory tests, using Rotem or TEG to identify and treat underlying issues like fibrinogen deficiency uh, or um, platelet dysfunction, which are both very common in this group of patients. Uh, and so constant monitoring for hyperfibrinolysis, which hopefully will have been treated by transamic acid, fibrinogen loss, which you will need to replace with um, things like cryoprecipitate, uh, and platelet dysfunction, which is a difficult area to understand, but certainly there is a, a role for platelet transfusions uh, uh, quite early on in the management of these patients. Um, and again, there are published um, guidelines for whether you, which um, viscoelastic point of care device you have, or if you only have laboratory tests, that's fine um, to look at the fact that monitoring fibrinogen, especially as the main um, substrate for clot is extremely important in these patients and I would urge you to chase down fibrinogen levels as quickly as possible and certainly to include some fibrinogen supplementation uh, within your major hemorrhage algorithms. Uh, so here's ours, again if bleeding continues we're repeatedly doing uh, Rotem analysis uh, and looking for and treating fibrinogen platelets, additional plasma if required and additional lysis uh, fibrinolysis treatment if required, but also looking at the electrolyte disturbances that can occur and hyperkalemia and hypocalcemia can um, severely affect the outcome in these patients and need aggressive monitoring throughout the resuscitation. So um, you know, lots still to do in this area, especially around the dose and exact products for the treatment of acute traumatic coagulopathy, but this general principle has definitely saved um, lives and improved outcomes from surgery in this group of patients. The final thing I want to talk about is ischemia. And ischemia, there's not a lot we can do about sadly, except reducing the duration of it. But ischemia is, cl is clearly becoming a um, bigger part of outcomes for these patients as we get people through the initial bleeding phase. And as I said, a lot of this is related to cardiac ischemia and the inadequate perfusion of the coronary arteries leading to myocardial death. And we can measure levels of um, cardiac myocardial death using uh, heart-associated fatty acid binding protein, troponin, which shows dramatic elevations in these associated with uh, adverse cardiac events and associated with poor outcomes, often you know, very quickly after damage control surgery where you get um, sudden elevations in the need for pressors like noradrenaline and adrenaline, uh, and then death um, subsequently. 
Uh, there are options coming in for this in terms of clinical trials, but really reducing the, the, the duration and depth of ischemia is key. So I think the basic tenets of hemostatic resuscitation remain true, and if you can guide your resuscitation and surgery along these lines, that's key. And keep in your mind this triad as you progress with these patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Brohi. Uh, next presentation is on uh, the place of riboa in trauma. And uh, uh, may I invite Professor Tal Hora. Uh, Professor Hora is a vascular surgeon uh, at the Oribro University Hospital uh, from Sweden. Uh, and He's the attending vascular surgeon working with advanced vascular surgery, both endo and open, for many years, with many years of interest in trauma and non-trauma he, uh, and hemodynamic instability, the, uh, with interest on the EVTM concept. And of special note, he's uh, helping us to establish Riboa in Sri Lanka. Over to you, sir. Hi, my name is Tal Hale. I'm a vascular surgeon in Sweden, originally from Israel. I would like to thank you for the invitation to participate. It's unfortunate we can do, not be in person, face to face. I hope it will come soon. So thank you very much for the Sri Lanka good people that invited me uh, and the society that inv invited me to come and join. Thank you very much. Let's speak about uh, Reboa and placing trauma. So Reboa is in clinical uh, use uh, worldwide. We just spoke about it in other meetings in AC, Asian and other meetings. And it's a hot topic that is very interesting, in, very interesting and it's growing the use of Reboa aortic balloon occlusion in trauma. These are some examples of how it looks in reality. We've been using it quite a lot of uh, years. Uh, have experience, of course, limited in trauma and other cases as many others. It can be used in trauma and non-trauma. And I think it's an important factor that you can use it even in non-trauma and be trained for your trauma cases as needed. It can be used doing CPR, for example, and has been used in selected patients doing CPR, like in these cases seen here where you place the access and the reboy itself and use it clinically. So why Reboa is a tool for the bleeding patient might, might add not only the bleeding, the unstable patient. Uh, it's minimally invasive. You can use it with quite minimal invasive method. It might be very invasive if you occlude the aorta. It can elevate the systolic blood pressure and your mean arterial pressure to get perfusion to the heart and to the brain. Might replace thoracotomy, well, in select cases and can be adjunct uh, to be used uh, doing other procedures like laparotomy. It can be used everywhere in every facility, even pre-hospital and bridge to surgery resuscitation. It allows you some time to think, to call more people, to get stabilization until you have things under control. And it's quite easy to use. It it's might be used too much also, depends where on which patient. In general, uh, we speak about evidence, there is low evidence for the use of reboin trauma. It's coming more and more evidence in the recent months came some new articles about it. And I think you can say that reboin in general has place in trauma patients uh, to decrease mortality and morbidity. But of course, depends on patient selection. Reboy is just a balloon and you have to remember it. It's just one tool in a toolbox, what we call the EVTM. Should it be used which patient what indication in a correct manner, correct team as part of this toolbox. And of course it might cause ischemia, reperfusion and complication issues. So you have to consider if to use it and how to use it. And we report some of our data in recent articles that shows that we use it several times a year in selected patients, but of course it's not used daily. This is some of publications about the EVTM concept and Reboy itself. And the idea about the EVTM concept is a multidisciplinary concept of using together tools. One of them is the Reboa as your endo tool, 
uh, embolization, stand graft, teamwork, shunts, endo shunts, modern imaging to get control of the patient situation, resuscitation, and getting better results. Uh, Rebo itself has been used in has been used in vascular surgery in many years in endografts and even in open surgical procedures to get control as you see this. We've been using it as I said many years and reported on it. And some of it is discussed in these landmark articles of EVTM textbook that is now out. Uh, you can mail to me if you want to get it. Uh, and in different other uh, books uh, and manuals, so EVTM is now established. It's a method. It's published. It can be used, and probably you and others are using it. It's just a matter of naming it in this form. Uh, we also use Rebo and other methods in, uh, in endovascular surgery, and we are doing all the procedures for uh, ruptures with endovascular means and get quite good results, and we use the Rebo itself. We will publish, publish this data soon. So Rebo elevates the blood pressure. It's a temporary thing. You get your pressure elevated but it does not stop the bleeding. So it's just one tool in a concept that you have to think about. It's not a solution. You use the Reboa to elevate the pressure, get stability, and then you have to do something else. Might give you time. And of course, you, it has to be used correctly. And we speak about partial Reboa. So you have to mitigate. You have to work on your pressure to get good pressure enough to do something, but not too low pressure and not too high pressure because you get, you get ischemia. And it's part of this concept, the EVTM, as we call it. And this is an example of a trauma patient, unstable, like ongoing CPR, a gunshot several times. And we did several procedures as laparotomy, as a stand graft in subclavia, as introduced the Reboa on arrival, et cetera, massive transfusion. And he, uh, he, we made it, uh, he, he went home. Uh, some data about it, we can take some hemodynamic data that is published by our groups and some other groups, and it can show what you can do with Reboa, how it affects the circulation. We know that the longer use of Reboa, the more ischemia you get, the, more, the lower pH, the higher lactate, interleukins, etc. So you have to think about the time. Time is essential. Short use of Reboa. Reperfusion, you have to think about using partial Reboa and as minimal as you can to prevent acidosis, hyperkalemia, and other uh, metabolic uh, problems that you will get guarantees, guarantee, uh, guarantee if you use the Reboa for a long time. And these patients are already uh, injured. Partial occlusion, as described the first time by this article and then by other groups, shows how to use a Rebo itself with partial occlusion and seen this in the older Rebo we use in a patient while we're, while we're holding the pressure of the patient and trying to stabilize until we get to the solution. The partial Rebo is seen here and seen in other publications, how you can use it and then you can measure different things to see if it can be done. And we have several patients that went through CT with Rebo in place and it's been published by different publication by publications by our groups, our group and other groups, and also in the ABO trauma registry, which is a registry to show the use, collect data on the use of Reboa in trauma. You can use it if you are there and you give patients to the registry, you can use the whole registry's open resource for data and collaboration. And we can see that when you use Reboa, the pressure elevates in majority of the patients. And even in patient in impending traumatic cardiac arrest, you see some effect of blood pressure. And an important factor would be that if you don't see elevation, which we call the delta, the responder, if you're not a responder to Reboa, then the chances to survive are very, very low. Probably the Reboa can be in the wrong place or the Reboa malfunctions, maybe the balloon was ruptured or the patient is dead and there is no cardiac output. And then you can see, in, this can see be seen in different uh, uh, publication. It's a hemodynamic tool. And that's why we say it's one of the tools to be used in the EVTM concept. There are different publications and now PhD works from, the, from our institute and others that discuss this matter, training, how to do it. And a lot of data can be, be gathered from these great publications. 
There are some limitations and possibilities. You can't transfer a patient from one center to another, like seen in this video. You can do CPR and maybe get some better perfusion. This we don't know, but you have to consider that Rebot does not stop the bleeding. And you see, as you see in the angiography there, it will, the patient will bleed, but maybe slower bleeding. So if you have to think about it, this is what happened when you take it out as in the end of surgery and in the other video you can see probably soon that uh, they see the decrease in bleeding uh, when uh, in the pig model that you see there with and without the balloon so it's not magic it's just very functional with the balloon now in place there are some downsides you can cause dissections and trauma formation so you have to think this is an invasive procedure correct patient, and of course, taking care of the access later on, taking care of the extremities and remove it in the correct way and to go on with, a, to check the distal status of the limbs. And of course, risk for abdominal compartment syndrome and ischemia reperfusion effect. So what is the place of reborn trauma? There is a place and it will stay. When to use which patient, this is not clear, there are some publications about the use and indication, contraindications for Reboa. And I think you have to read yourself and decide which patient is the correct one. But we mean the patient that is bleeding, potentially bleeding to elevate the pressure, especially in non-compressible bleeders, pelvic trauma. Some of it is in guidelines already and some we are working in. And it's in different publications, you can see more information on this. So Ribura is used, it expands in trauma and non-trauma, and the major thing is to, call, to, to take the right patient who would benefit from elevating the pressure temporary, holding the patient until you do something else. Some of the patient, not all bleeders. Time is running and Rebo is only a bridge, so use it correctly. Re use partial Rebo or intermittent Rebo to avoid reperfusion and, and ischemia uh, injuries. Proactive approach, you have to check the distal status, the abdominal compartment status, and a teamwork. Probably the problem comes even in the ICU, day one, two, and three. If the patient survived the ER to the next level, you have to be with him the whole time and check how he, fe he feels. Rebo causes severe metabolic uh, problems, so you have to consider it when using it. And it should be used, in my opinion, as part of the EVDM concept in the correct patient. It's published again in the top stand manual and other publications like the JVTM, quite a lot of publication on these issues. So you're very welcome to read it. It's free online on www.jevtm.com. We hope to have more cooperation, more collaboration, more workshops. We will meet in Sweden the coming December in an EVTM workshop. And I hope we will can come to the Far East soon also and we I would love to come to Sri Lanka and see if there any way me or I or other people can help. Uh, I think some great people are involved that can help. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to share with you uh, this presentation and uh, goodbye. Thank you, uh, Professor Talhova, uh, to giving us an uh, opportunity to listen to the Reboa and uh, certainly that uh, Sri Lanka is waiting for your help and to establish that. Let us uh, come to, uh, listen to the final and the fifth uh, speaker. He's from Blomfontein and uh, South Africa. He's a trauma surgeon and um, Andre uh, Lobser. And uh, we are, he is going so to speak you. on very uh, unusual uh, topic. Actually, we don't hear this uh, topic um, being uh, discussed um, in, uh, you know, very often. And he will speak to us on tracheobronchial laryngeal injuries. Over to you, uh, Andre. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a word of thanks to the organizing committee who, um, who asked me to talk at this prestigious conference of yours. Uh, I must also thank them for their regular and continuous communication regarding my participation. My name is Andre Loebscher. I'm a consultant trauma and burn surgeon in uh, Bloemfontein. Bloemfontein is in the center of South Africa with a mainly farming and industrial community. When we look at uh, laryngotracheal trauma, that also includes the bronchus. One of the first, what we read about this trauma was in 1873, 
where Suave described a woman who was crushed by a wagon wheel and was subsequently found to have avulsion of the right main stem bronchus on a topsy. In 1931, Rudolf Nissen performed the first pneumonectomy on a 12-year-old girl, also who sustained crush injury to the thorax. Um, she initially presented with a left tension pneumothorax due to a tear in the left main stem bronchus. Mohamed Vassif from the Aga Khan University concluded his talk on laryngotracheal trauma as the following. He said, laryngotracheal trauma is a rare entity but can pose serious threats to one's life. We must always have a high level of suspicion and immediate care should be provided to prevent complications. Recent advances in tissue regeneration have added a new rise in the management of laryngotracheal trauma, but more work needs to be done in the less explored field, including laryngeal transplantation. Laryngotracheal trauma continues to be a rare entity. And since almost the past two decades, uh, the figure of one out of 30,000 ER visits in the United States is mentioned. It is the second most common cause of death in patients with head and neck trauma after intracranial injury, and only 0.5% of multi-trauma patients were reported to have injury to the airway at any level. Laryngeal injuries are therefore often missed due to the infrequency and result in low clinical suspicion. One retrospective study from the Tulane University found that the overall mortality for patients that sustained injury to the tracheobronchial tree was 17%, and with a mortality of trauma to the cervical trachea reported to be 14%. A recent study from India, Parida, uh, did a study on uh, neck injured patients from January 2011 to March 2016. 253 patients presented with a neck injury, of which 26 patients presented with a breach in laryngotracheal framework. It was identified by clinical examination and by a radiological study. And um, these patients then were included in the study. And it found that it was mainly blunt and penetrating trauma, of which blunt trauma was from road accidents and hanging. And the penetrating is cutthroat as a homicide. And this is what I see here in my region at the moment, that uh, it seems that it is very easy to kill another person by cut, cutting his throat. As we also see as societal, and then in his study, there was also one bull gore injury and also a pen up injury. We found that the clinical presentation were mainly respiratory distress and surgical emphysema, but also dysphonia, bleeding from the side, dysphagia, hemoptysis, and aphonia. And in three patients, there was an endotracheal tube in situ. Endoscopic findings were congestion and uh, edematous vocal cord, the hematoma of the vocal cord, restricted vocal cord mobility, unilateral vocal cord palsy, a avulsed left cord in one patient, and hematoma of the aryepiglottic fold and avulsed epiglottis, and also a avulsed anterior commission. Complications were uh, mild dysphonia, aspiration, wound infection, granulation tissue, residual vocal cord palsy, a grade one subglottic stenosis, and a poor voice in one patient. In a Canadian study, we were warned that laryngotracheal injuries are not as scarce as we think it is. And Randall showed that um, a one in 2,478 ED visits, one in 1,042 inpatient admissions, and one out of 481 trauma patients. So this concluded that um, we must really have a look out for these injuries 
as it is not as scarce as we always thought. We use the um, Schaefer classification for determining severity of laryngeal injuries, and it depends. The grade one will be a minor endolaryngeal hematoma of the laceration without detectable fractures, while five is a complete laryngotracheal separation. And this is very good to describe and to evaluate your injury um, according what your plan of management would be. Most of our patients will receive non-operative management. And the intervention that we would like to do is first the head of the bed elevation. And this helps to decrease the laryngeal edema, but also manage the secretions. The voice should be resting. Cool humidified air it decreases the capillary paralysis to improve management of secretions. And then steroids is always, as usual, um, there's no level one supporting data, but however, it might help to reduce the edema. And very important is anti-reflex medications as it prevents laryngeal inflammation from acid reflux. Here we can see that most of our patients with um, grade one and two injuries might receive no treat a surgical treatment while um, a laryngeal repair is most common in a grade five injury. So therefore that uh, most of our surgical intervention, tracheostomy, laryngoscopy, uh, bronchoscopy, esophagoscopy, and esophageal repair, tracheal and laryngeal repair will be done um, of grade two up to grade five. Walter Lee from Cleveland uh, gave us the 10 steps to perform an open reduction or surgical intervention. The first step is to assess the injury. Secondly, to secure the airway at all stages, prevent and control infection, and four, define the injury by grading the injury. Then we have to take the patient to theater and deprive and perform immediate grafting, if indicated. Restore soft tissue and skeletal cartilages by reduction, repositioning, grafting, and or resection and stomosis. We have to immobilize and fix fractures with internal support by stenting, wiring, or mini plating. We find that mini plating has much less uh, complication than the wiring and as well as stenting. We have to close any fistula and that is why it's important always to look at the esophagus and see whether the esophagus is not injured. We stent to provide internal support. We can use bolster grafts and flaps to prevent webs and aspiration. And include management of the tracheostomy and tracheostomy always in your surgical plan. Gastroesophageal reflux can undermine even the best of reconstructive techniques. It should be controlled by head elevation, anti-acid, H2 blockers, um, or then proton pump inhibitors. Nasogastric tubes should be avoided at all. And if feeding by mouth is to be prohibited, rather do a gastrostomy. Aspiration following laryngotrauma can occur as a result of different mechanisms, like, for instance, the uh, tracheostomy cuff is uh, too uh, much inflated. And uh, uncontrolled life-threatening aspirations, as well as infections, may require radical measures, such as prolonged stenting, diversion, occlusion, and even a total laryngectomy. In severe cases. So long-term treatment and close follow-up are necessary in cases where scarring may progress and persist. Let's have a look at the hyoid bone. Fractures are extremely rare and the etiology is normally strangulation, sport injuries or motor vehicle accidents where the steering wheel is normally the causative agent. In a review um, of 2012 of 46 patients who sustained hyoid bone fractures, five underwent surgical repair, 15 patients required the tracheostomy and surgical intervention, 
but most of the patients were treated with voice rest, diet changes, and symptomatic analgesia. Non-surgical management of the fractured hyoid bone is the most common method of treatment. If pain over the fracture of the hyoid persists, some groups advocate with not very good results excising the bone on either side of the fracture to prevent crepitus. Thyroid and cricoid cartilages ossify during early childhood. The age of the patient can influence the pattern of injury. So a calcified laryngeal complex in an older patient may fracture in more than one place, whereas in the more elasticity of the larynx will usually fracture as at a single site in a younger person. The fracture occurs when the thyroid cartilage is forced against the cervical spine, like for instance in a strangulation, flattens and then jumps back into position resulting in an anterior linear fracture down the thyroid prominence that can be um, managed with a, a simple plate. Non-displaced fractures of the thyroid cartilage that have no evidence of internal derangement or endoscopy can be managed non-operatively with supported measures. All the displaced fractures of the thyroid cartilage uh, should undergo open reduction. We can use a low cervical thyroidectomy incision and should be realigned with a, with a mini plate that we prefer, a wire or non-absorbable monofilament suture. Mini plate fixation was shown to be superior to suture or wire fixation because it promotes complete cartilage union, union, whereas the lateral two methods promote healing by fibrinous union. The external perichondrium of the cartilage should always be reapproximated. Close reduction of small fractures or arytenoid dislocations followed by endoscopic placement of an airway stent has been trialed. However, the experience is limited with unfavorable results. Surgical intervention should be done via the open procedure. If there is also evidence of internal derangement on the preoperative endoscopy, such as evolved vocal cord or displaced epiglottis, this must be repaired after the cartilage to ensure that the proper scaffold is obtained before realignment of the mucosa. The laryngeal lumen can be assessed either through the fracture itself or via laryngofissure midline, midline incision through the thyroid cartilage. Mucosal defects are repaired with absorbable suture material and buried knots to prevent granuloma formation. If there is extensive mucosal loss, then we can use a free graft from mucosa, skin or dermis, um, may be used to fix the defect. I must be honest, I prefer buccal mucosa. That can be sometimes very challenging to do, but otherwise skin works as well. Cricoid cartilage. Injury to the cricoid cartilage is often associated with fractured thyroid cartilage. Since the cricoid is a complete ring, it usually fractures in two places, on the anterior side and posterior side, and non-displaced stable fractures can be managed non-operatively. If the fracture segments are unstable, the cartilage should be wired, and a soft stent such as silicone should be inserted and kept in place for four to six weeks. We um, also, I read through a article about the Montgomery tube that is very often used here in India. A crushed cricoid ring should have a tracheostomy placed on presentation and the cricoid should be excised in a delayed fashion once the surrounding edema has improved. This usually only requires excision of the anterior half of the cartilage, which can be replaced with a high bone or a rib graft at the later stage. Penetrating wounds to the trachea bronchial tree um, normally uh, seals by itself within uh, 48 hours. We just have to inflate the endotracheal tube distal to the injury to prevent leakage of air into the subcutaneous tissue and mediastinal spaces. Any hemodynamically abnormal patient who presents with a penetrating neck wound should undergo emergency neck exploration in the operating room.
And after securing the airway, we can do the laryngoscopy or the bronchoscopy or the esophagoscopy um, uh, after the patient is hemodynamically normal. The repair of any injury should only be attempted after the airway is secure. And very important, the esophagus and the hypopharynx should also be systemically evaluated for concurrent injury by pharyngoscopy or esophagoscopy. Just uh, some graphs from um, Dr. Moon Sami. And this is uh, the first picture that we see is actually uh, the emergency airway treatment of any patient, especially when it is outside the hospital. And here you can see a complete cricothyroid um, uh, separation and then primary sutures, uh, primary suturing as soon as possible. The exposure of the intrathoracic trachea on the posterior aspect can be reached via a posterolateral thoracotomy. Just remember to always use the intercostal muscle flap to secure your suture line. With a complete transection of both the esophagus as well as the trachea, we have to repair both organs and um, secure our anastomosis line with a muscle flap as well as um, these patients always will always need a tracheostomy. Example again of blunt uh, trauma to the neck of a child. On the CT scan one can see the surgical lymphocema and then on operation field we see the primary management of the cricoid injury of blunt uh, trauma to the neck that um, resulted into a fracture of the thyroid cartilage. One can see the surgical lymphocema on the CT scan and on the right one can see the open reduction. So what are the latest advancements in laryngotracheal trauma? So laryngotracheal reconstruction is a very complex and challenging procedure and in the past two decades much work has been done in this field ranging from simple grafting to reconstruction to tissue engineering. Up to now, complete laryngotracheal regeneration is a bit far-fetched, but tissue regeneration and individual, at individual sites have shown some positive results. This concept is based on to, upon three factors that we call tissue engineering triad, and that is cell therapy, scaffolding therapy, and growth factor therapy. The cells for cell therapy can be procured endogenously by the controlling behavior of already present stem cells, your induced adipose tissue derived stromal cells, human embryonic stem cells, and bone marrow derived mesenchymal stromal cells. Building material provides a suitable environment for cell infiltration, proliferation, and regeneration, which is essential for tissue restoration. Scaffolding material has to be biocompatible as well as biodegradable. This scaffolding we use in burns and in deep wounds, where you use um, the scaffold as a dermis, and it works very well. Hyaluronic acid and collagen are commonly used as a regenerative scaffold. Basic fibroblast growth factor and the hepatocyte growth factor are the more popular and more successful of the regulatory factors. They have strong antifibrotic and restorative effects. Trauma where there is total destruction of the larynx and the trachea, laryngotracheal transplant can be considered. The laryngotracheal transplant, apart from restoring the physiological function of the larynx, also provides great improvement in quality of life. A laryngotracheal transplant was performed by Farrell, which uh, produced successful results. The laryngeal framework, along with the adjacent thyroid and parathyroid glands, and the feeding vessels were harvested from the donor. After two weeks of surgery, the patient was able to use her vocal cords.
and was able to swallow and with physiotherapy and speech therapy were able to speak again. Again, my sincere thanks to the organizing committee and for your attention. And this paper is open for discussion. Henry, and for that comprehensive uh, the account on very rare complex, uh, the, uh, the tracheobronchial and laryngeal complex injuries. And um, it's time for uh, the questions. I can see two of our five faculties are online, Karim and Elmin. Unfortunately, others had some problems. I think uh, Professor Talhoa is on uh, is doing um, surgery. And um, uh, Kenneth Buffett and uh, Andrea, they were unable to log in. Uh, I think apparently uh, I was informed that there are some technical problems. Anyway, nice to have you there. Let me uh, ask a few questions uh, which have been posed by the audience. And our audience is mainly young surgeons and uh, trainees. Um, Elmin, I'll uh, direct this to you or, and um, uh, the Karim. And um, if there is a superior surface bleeding from the liver and uh, with the evidence of diaphragmatic injury, very rare uh, occurrence, and um, do you advise to uh, cut the right chest and open the right chest or how do you, do you have, can you comment on that? Surface bleeder from the liver, is it a good idea to open the chest? Is that the question? Yeah, you, you do a laparotomy, you see that the superior surface is uh, bleeding and uh, associated diaphragmatic injury, a rare, and the right dome of the diaphragm. Do, do, you ha do you open the right chest as well, or do you, can you manage without that? That's the question. Well, if, it, if, it's, if the question is to stop the bleeding, I think it's yeah. the most practical thing is to not open the chest, not open the diaphragm, pack it, give it a chance to settle down and pay attention to the, um, the coagulopathy and the other reasons for bleeding. If it's about repairing the diaphragm in a stable patient, Yes, we can consider that. But if it's an unstable patient with a bleeding liver, I would delay the repair of the diaphragm and first focus on stopping the bleeding, which in most cases it would be a more uh, dealt with with a much more um, conservative approach by packing pressure and uh, repairing the physiology first. Right, thank you. And. Um if there is a, the bleeding in the caudate lobe of the liver, probably associated with um, venous bleeding, and do, do you find that the, 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 um, the mobilization and the release of duodenum and, uh, will help uh, the secretion? I think that, you know, when we're dealing with, uh, with liver injuries, there, there's such a spectrum of, of possibilities and, and so much more information that is needed. Um, of course, there's definitive management and there's uh, damage control management, but in somewhere in between, there was, there's always a most simplest management, the way of dealing with things without doing additional surgery, without doing additional dissection. So I'm, I'm saying if the duodenum needs to be mobilized, by all means, it must be mobilized. But if there is no need for that, and it's merely a venous bleed, I would definitely treat it with uh, pressure, with packing, with the most conservative and least invasive steps first. And we know that venous bleeds will stop. We know that if you, even if you have a major venocaval injury or a retrohepatic vein injury, they stop with packing. And, and that's where, what my advice would be. If it's a very broad question you're asking me, my advice is keep it simple, um, ensure that there's no agulopathy, ensure the patient is warm, ensure that the patient is perfusing and not acidotic, and pack it and wait, and um, then make decisions. Because venous bleeds do not need major surgical intervention. They need a chance to, to settle down and most of them will stop. Thanks. Thank you. Can I direct the next question to uh, Karim? And um, is there a place of uh, bicarbonate in acute bleeding and hypolemic shock? 
Um, no, not really. So, is this one? Um, used to, um, when you open uh, the temporary abdomen, uh, temporary abdomen closure, because uh, if there is a, a compartment syndrome and so on, I used to give a bolus of uh, bicarb just before opening it because the tamponade, once the tamponade is released, the, uh, the uh, cardium, uh, myocardium get toxins. Is that something you believe in or I used to do that? Um, I think when you're releasing anything that might give you a reperfusion in injury, it's important that anesthesia is prepared to manage that. So they need to have enough, um, you know, a volume on board. Um, you, there's a big hit from potassium usually, and you need to have enough um, calcium on board to counteract that, and possibly you may need boluses of, of insulin. I think the effect of acid per se is minimal um, and is unlikely to correct. Uh, you, you're unlikely to help much by giving bicarbonate. But if, it, if you're only using it for that purpose, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that either. Um, uh, I think the, the routine use of bicarbonate to correct acidemia, though, is, isn't... Uh, good practice and doesn't really achieve your aims. I thank you. The Sri Lanka is, uh, is, is just started getting the taste of the Rotom now. Um, we have uh, started in few places. Now I can see that your protocol is uh, the Rotom based or the thromboelastometry based. Now uh, is uh, the, the itatic uh, study confirm it or how, how, what do you think actually? I can ask both of you, in fact. So, I think, <laughs> yes, the <laughs> I'm biased tonight. Um, so, the, the eye tactic study, for those of you who don't know, was a study that looked at um, treating patients with empiric care, um, which was tranexamic acid and then balanced red cells and plasma um, transfusions to maintain volume. And then on top of that, patients were randomized to have additional therapy guided by lab tests or additional therapy guided by thromboelastometry or thromboelastopathy. Um, and in the round, uh, that there was no difference between the two groups uh, in terms of their 28-day um, mortality. Um, however, if you look at patients who were actually cardiopathic within the group, um, more, there was a large mortality difference, although not significant because we were underpowered in that group. And there was also, interestingly, a large mortality difference in patients who already had a, who also had a traumatic brain injury, and that was statistically significant, although obviously it's a subgroup analysis. So um, I think the, the jury is probably still out, and I think one thing that's important is that the the tests are just diagnostic tests. They don't tell you what to give. Uh, and I think what they may be showing us is that we're not giving enough or we're not giving the right thing um, for some of these patients. But uh, that's further work. But I think the devices themselves are useful in showing you what coagulation is doing uh, at, at the time and making people think about it and act on it. Elvin, do you use uh, thromboelastrometry in your incorporate in your protocols? Yeah. Yes, we do. But I must add, you know, that um, there's best practice and there's practice within the limitations of resources. And then there is, if you have the opportunity to gain more knowledge about that patient at that moment, never mind what all the research. Uh, or, or this subtle differences in that in the research project has shown yes. the the basis of the, the the bottom line is those patients were treated very well they were treated adequately and properly according to protocol and um, if thromboelastogram can come in and help us a little bit more to get closer to what is the ideal then we must use it and if we don't have huge uh, blood supplies or the platelet stock is running out at least by using the uh, thromboelastogram, you, you have an idea of where your problems are lying. Yeah. So I'm for the use of it, yes. but I must say that 
every hospital will have to figure it out for themselves because the resources and, the, and, and what is available immediately is not always the same and is not always comparable to what international studies are able to show. And, and if I can add, in, in, even in our own environment, it, from day to day, you may not have the same resources. So we may be running out of blood or there's only limited um, amounts of, of, of some of the um, plotting, profile, plotting um, replacements uh, factors. So you, you have to be able to, to do with the best with what you got. Thank you. I think uh, that is the end of um, the questions. I will ask my colleague to uh, conclude the session. Let me take this opportunity uh, to thank Professor Ken Buffett, Professor Elmin Stein, Professor Karim Brohi, Professor Tal Hora, and Dr. Andre Lobzer for their contribution uh, on this trauma symposium in the uh, Sri Lanka Surgical Congress celebrating the, fifth, uh, the golden jubilee of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka. So let me thank you on behalf of the President and the Council of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka. Thank you very much.